Well, I'm excited today about um, the Word of God and what God has in store for us on today. Uh, to everybody online, my name is Deborah Hubbard. Uh, pleasure to have you join us. So glad that you're with us. Uh, for those of you in the house, any first timers in the house? First timers in the house? Woo! What's up, y'all? What's up? Man, so good to have y'all. So good to have y'all. Online, any first timers online? If you're online first time, let us know who you are, where you are. If you're a first timer, we want to ask you to fill out a Connect card. Uh, it's online. You can just give us some information. We promise we're not going to share your information with a whole bunch of people. We just want to stay connected with you, share with you opportunities uh, for us to connect and for you to connect with us and for us to grow together. So if you could do that for us, we would greatly appreciate it if you would fill out the Connect card. Uh, as well, we realize that, man, God has blessed us and uh, in this modern day and time as a result. And since the pandemic, we don't pass an offering plate, but we have the privilege of being able to give. Uh, so if you give to support this ministry, I want to say thanks. Everybody who gives support this ministry, can you praise God just for the privilege to be able to give <laughs> online and in person? Amen. It's giving time. It's giving time. So for those of you who are online or in person, you give digitally. I want to encourage you to go ahead and do that. Many of you, you place your offering in the offering containers on the walls as you enter or leave, and we want to say thanks for that. I want to encourage you to continue to do that. Everybody online, can you make sure, please subscribe uh, to the YouTube channel. I want to encourage you to like, if you've already been blessed, to like what's taking place. Those of you who are in person, if you haven't subscribed yet, I want to encourage you to subscribe and like. And then turn on your notifications. We were on YouTube this week and Facebook this week, and we want you to know when we pop on to give a word to you so that you can get it immediately, because you might need it immediately. Uh, but we also want you to understand that that's your way to help us evangelistically, that as you subscribe, as you like, as you comment, as you share, you help us within the algorithm so that we can get this message out to more people. How many of you want to get the message out to more people? Amen. So it's a simple way for you to help us get the message out to more people. So if you haven't subscribed yet, do that. Like, share, comment, all that. That helps us to get the word out to more people. So we encourage you to do that. Well, today, uh, I want to talk to you about managing your energy. Mm-hmm. Tell somebody, mm-hmm. Tell somebody you're a little different today. I don't know what's up. You're a little different today. All right, I want to talk to you about managing your energy and not your time. Here's the big idea, sermon in a sentence. Managing energy is the key to fulfilling purpose. Managing energy is the key to fulfilling purpose. How many of you have ever said, man, I wish I had more time? Anybody? <laughs> wish I had more time. Well, you don't. You don't have more time. Here, here's the beautiful thing about time. Time is common. Time does not discriminate. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you live. I don't care how much education you have. I don't care what language you speak, what culture you come from. Time does not discriminate. I don't care what kind of job you have. You have just as much time as every world leader in a day. Every world leader gets 24 hours in a day. Guess what? You get 24 hours in a day. It does not discriminate. It is common. All of us have the same amount of time. Some of us say, man, I wish I could get this promotion and do this and do that, right? But we're trying to figure out how we're going to do what we're currently doing with the time we have, right? But everybody has the same amount of time, some people just have gotten better at managing or utilizing time than some of us have. Time is common. The other thing is that time is fixed. As I shared, there are 24 hours in a day. Anybody got different? You got different hours in your day? All right, 24 hours in a day. Just wanted to check. Just wanted to check. Right, 24 hours in a day, 8,760 hours in a year, right? It's, it's just fixed. It's fixed. It's not going to change for any of us. I don't care how much you complain about it. I don't care what you think about it. It's going to be the same. Every day, it's going to be the same. Every week, it's going to be the same. Month, every year, it's going to be the same. It is fixed. One writer says, time is a strange commodity. We can't save it, retrieve it, relive it, stretch it, borrow it, loan it, stop it, 
or store it, but can only use it or lose it. Isn't it interesting? You can make more money, but you can never get back time. Think about that. Time is also brief. Please hear me. Even if you live to be 100 years old, how many of you want to live to be 100? I don't know. I used to think so. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I used to, I used to think so. I don't know. Right? I don't know. Right? Right? But, but time is brief. Even if you live to be 100, 100 years old is so brief in comparison to eternity. Right? Time is brief. The psalmist says that our days are numbered. Right? So in the U.S., the average lifespan is 76.4 years. If you 76, I'm not saying you only got 0.4 left. I'm just saying <laughs> the average span in the U.S., 76.4, right? For African-American women, it's 71.8. And for African-American men, it's 68 years. And we know, depending on where you live in the U.S., if you're an African-American male, that time can be significantly reduced. So the psalmist says, Lord, teach us to number our days carefully so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. One writer says, life is too short for us to do everything we want to do, but it's long enough for us to do everything God wants us to do. Mm. Now I want you to think about that because you don't know how long you have but you got enough time to do what God wants you to do. I would call that purpose. God has given each of us enough time to fulfill our God-given purpose. So can I ask, are you currently maximizing yourself in time to live out your God-given purpose? Because you don't know if you're going to be here tomorrow, you assume you will. You don't know if you'll be here next month. I ask again, are you currently maximizing your time to fulfill your God-given purpose? Many of us think about time, but I'm not sure we spend enough time thinking about and talking about managing our energy. And here's why that's important, because we have less energy than we have time. Take a moment and ponder it. Tony Swartz, the founder of the Energy Management Project, says in his 2007 article in the Harvard Business Review, managing energy is about balancing your energy expended and your energy renewed. Managing energy is important because we need to manage energy to make the most of our time. We can't maximize or effectively manage ourselves in time if we don't manage our energy. So online, there are times in the room where I get this look like, hmm. So let me take a moment. For example, if you have 24 hours in the day, like we all do, but you have, according to Planet Fitness, low E. I love those commercials. <laughs> right, you have low energy, even though you have 24 hours in a day, if you only have enough energy to maximize two of those hours or three of those hours, then you've lost some time in the day. So us having energy and being able to manage our energy will have a direct impact on our ability to manage ourselves in time. The goal, therefore, should be to effectively manage our energy so that we can maximize time to achieve our purpose. So how do we effectively manage energy? I'm so glad you asked. Tell somebody that was a good question. So here's how we do it. One, I want to encourage you to pay attention to your energy. Pay attention to when are you at your best mentally. When are you at your best emotionally. When are you at your best physically and Spiritually, Carrie Newhoff in his book, At Your Best, says, we are at our best when we focus our time, leverage our energy, and realize our priorities. He calls this 
the Thrive Cycle. You see, there are several factors that influences our available energy. How much sleep we get influences our available energy. What we eat, our diet, influences our available energy. How many breaks we take influences our available energy. Who we spend time with influences our available energy. Side note, if you're spending time with a whole bunch of people and they're depleting you of your energy, it affects your available energy. Our ability to move and how often we move affects our available energy. Our emotions affect our available energy, which is why we need to regulate, learn to regulate our emotions and not just be all out of control, not just say what you think and how you feel and because you feel like you're in a bad mood and everybody going to get your bad mood. Why? Because it impacts your available energy and our understanding of purpose or our lack of understanding of purpose impacts our available energy. So we need to pay attention to our energy to pay attention to when am I operating at optimal energy level. Research suggests that most people, the average person, only has about three to five hours in a given day when they're operating at peak performance. Three to five hours when they're operating at peak performance. That's with them paying attention to their energy and doing everything they can to make sure they operate at peak performance. Think about that. Most of us work eight to ten hour days. The employer knows you really only going to give them three to four good hours. And yet they pay you for eight anyway. All right? That's just according to research, right? So paying attention to our energy is the first way that we monitor and manage our energy. Here's the second one. I want to spend a little time here. Tell somebody, for those of you who are accustomed to normal church, he's going to get to the scripture. He's going to get to it, all right? Here's the second way we, out, we deal with our energy. We need to learn to optimize our energy. What do we mean by that? We want to pay attention to it. We want to pay attention to it so then we can optimize it, develop daily habits that help us to be at our best mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. So paying attention to what drains you. I mean, this is talking about people. What experiences drain you? Some aspects of your work drain you, for example. Administrative work drains me. I hate it. It drains me. It just drains the life out of me, right? So paying attention to what drains you, but also paying attention to what fills you. What causes your energy level to go up? What are the kind of things that feed you, that, that generate excitement and passion on the inside of you? Why? Because you have to manage a balance between what's draining you and what's filling you so that you don't get empty so that you can operate at peak level. We talk about optimizing our energy. We're talking about paying attention physically. When does your body operate at optimum level? Right? So paying attention to our diet. I'm going to say it again. Paying attention to our diet, right? We're sluggish sometimes because of the stuff we're eating, the stuff we're drinking. It naturally causes you to be sluggish. You can't eat carbs all day and not be sluggish, right? It, so we got to pay attention to our diet and pay attention to what naturally causes my body to be at its best. When do I feel the strongest? When do I feel the most alert? So I want to pay attention to my body. That means I'm going to monitor my sleep. How many hours of sleep do I need? How many people need eight plus hours in the room? Eight plus. All the eight plus people. How, how many you do well? I'm not talking about you just making it. You learn to live by it. But you do well between like five and eight. You get five and eight, you like, man, I'm, I'm peak. I'm five to eight, right? Now, those of you who are getting less than five, I understand there are a whole bunch of issues, right? Because there are a whole bunch of issues that can affect sleep. And we just got to be honest with that, right? So it's working to say, how can I work through that, work with my doctors to address that to try to maximize my sleep? So physically, what helps me emotionally, right? So if I'm going to optimize my energy emotionally, what kind of things do I need to do? What do I need to learn about my emotions? What do I need to learn about my brain and how my brain processes my emotions so that emotionally I can be at optimal level. I can't allow other people to cause me to be up and down emotionally. That's giving you too much power. 
Why would I give you the power to cause me to be up and down? That just doesn't sound right. So I need to learn by God's grace to be able to regulate my emotions so even when you up or down, I'm still the same. I'm not phased by you. Why? Because I've worked on my emotional health. So paying attention to what kind of things do we need to do emotionally? What kind of things do we need to do mentally? How are we taking in things mentally so we can be mentally strong? Now I understand everybody's not a reader, but you need some intake. I'll say it again. Everybody's not a reader, but you need some intake. And you need some intake that's going to feed your brain. So there's some great things on TikTok. But there's some junk food on TikTok too. Right? So make sure if you're taking in from TikTok, if that's your primary medium of intake, then you got to get some good stuff from it. If you're going to use YouTube, get some good stuff from it. The whole point is making sure we're taking in good stuff for our minds. And then spiritually, we talked about it last week, making sure we're eating, making sure we're eating the word, right? We want to eat the word, apply the word, and trust the God of the word, right? So making sure we're eating the word and then consuming other things related to God. So we want to make sure that we can optimize our energy. And thirdly, we want to align our energy with purpose. What do we mean by this? What is it that you have been uniquely created to do? And how do you assess that? What are your passions? What are your skills? What's your gifting? And once you understand your passion, you understand your skills, and you understand your gifting, then how do you align or set your priorities based on your understanding of who God has made you to be? I'll spend a little bit of time here because... I think we struggle here. So I'll, I'll make a couple of recommendations. Again, I don't like reading, but I understand the importance of information. Okay? So I'll throw out an old reference, the Purpose Driven Life book. Right? Because some of us are trying to get purpose specifically when we don't understand purpose generally. I'll say that again. We're trying to get purpose specifically. What am I supposed to do? before we understand generally what did God create human beings to do. The greater clarity I have generally on what God has created human beings to do for his glory, to honor him, to worship him, to serve him, to love him, the more I am grounded in the general understanding of purpose, then it helps me now with the specificity of my purpose. Because it becomes, okay, you made me a human being just like everybody else, but I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am unique from everybody else. I am one of a kind. And when you made me, you had something specific in mind for me. But I got to understand the general before I can get to the specific. But I need to understand why am I here? Why? Because I want to be able to say when I close my eyes, I fought the fight. I finished my course and I kept the fa- I don't just want to finish a course I don't want to run your race mm, side note too many of us running other folks races side note stop running your mama's race your cousin race your friends race run your own race but you got to understand the general to get clarity on the specific to know what God created you specifically to do so we want to align our energy with our purpose why is that important because it is purpose that gives me motivation okay so let me say it this way Uh, I know most of y'all I didn't want a pastor love y'all 25 years later I didn't want a pastor I wanted to do anything but pastor. Why? I've seen it. I know what it looks like, and I know how people are. I ain't want to do this, right? But I'm clear this is what God told me to do. Now, here's what I had to grow to understand. Pastoring is not my purpose. God has created me to serve him and my generation through my voice. 
I'm currently utilizing my voice for the glory of God in the role of pastoring. And because I understand that distinction, I can still continue with my purpose even when I'm not a pastor. But it's because I have clarity on purpose, I can embrace certain roles, which also means I say no to other roles, right? Because if I understand God wants to use my voice for his glory and his honor, then there may be other spaces that's not a church space that God can use my voice for his glory and his honor. So I can say yes, but it may be other opportunities that other people think are good for me, but I know don't align with purpose that God say no to. See, see, what begins to happen is the, the more clarity I have on purpose, the easier it is for me to tell you no. Well, you came to mind when this came up. Okay. Nope. <laughs> so I'll move on. So I just finished a, a great book. Uh, again, I like books. You can look at the videos too. Uh, just finished listening to a great book on Audible uh, called Your Purpose is Calling. Dr. Darius Daniels, if you've never heard him, heard of him, you need to pay attention to him. Your Purpose is Calling, great book. What I love about the book is he spends time highlighting the importance of your uniqueness and understand Darius Daniels, D-H-A-R-I-U-S, D-A-N-I-E-L-S, Darius Daniels. Here is the important thing about your uniqueness. Oftentimes the things that drive you crazy, drive you up a wall may be a hint of your uniqueness. Because if it bothers you so much, maybe God put you here to do something about it. I'll move on. Tell somebody he getting ready to go to the scripture now. So why is this important? Because the use of our time is important for us to have the ability to use the energy to maximize time. Remember the goal is to effectively manage our energy so that we can maximize time to achieve our purpose. Here's where we anchor ourselves. Paul, a servant of Christ, one who was in rebellion to Jesus, eventually surrendered to Jesus, not just in rebellion, but he was taking people to jail if they believed in Jesus, having people killed if they believed in Jesus. But then he came to a place where he believed in Jesus. He writes to some followers of Christ in a place called Ephesus, and in chapter 5, he says some things to them that I just want to lift up, and then we'll be done. Chapter 5, beginning at verse 15, listen to what he says. Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of your time. Some translations say redeeming the time, because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Some translations say what God wants. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Notice he begins by pay attention to how you walk. Uh, some older translations say walk circumspectly, right? This whole idea of walk, this is not the first time he's mentioned the concept of walk in his letter to the followers in Ephesus. So, for example, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, he tells them to walk worthy of their calling or their vocation, to to walk in a way, when he talks about walk, he's talking about your lifestyle. Somebody say lifestyle. <laughs> your lifestyle matter. Your lifestyle matters. How we live as followers of Jesus Christ matters. He says walk in a way that is worthy of the vocation or the calling that you have. Walk in a way that is consistent with the fact that you are a child of God, that you are a kingdom citizen, that you have been brought out of darkness and into the marvelous light. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, he says, no longer walk as Gentiles. Those were non-Jews, but his reference is no longer walk in a way like people who don't know God. 
Walk in a way that people should know based on your walk that you actually know God. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2, he says, walk in love. And then he says, not the love you may sing about or hear in music on the radio, but walk in love that's in alignment with the kind of love Christ has. He says in Ephesians chapter 5 and 2. And then Ephesians 5 and 8, walk as children of the light. He's talking about walk in a way that we represent God in all that we do. So pay attention to how you walk or walk accurately or walk precisely. So here are the two things I want to talk about. I want to talk about a wise walk and a spirit-filled walk. Now, here's why this is going to be important. And I'll tell you later on about the manage, management of energy. He talks about a wise walk, understanding the importance of redeeming the time and the will of God. So he says, in, uh, I, I want you to have a wise walk. And he says, redeeming the time. Redeeming the time communicates this idea, making the most of every opportunity that is presented to you. Because the days are evil. Making the most of every opportunity that is presented to you. He says, I want you to walk wise. What does it mean to walk wise? I want you to pay attention to the opportunities that are before you, operating with a sense of urgency because you understand that time is limited and the days are evil. Operating with a sense of urgency because you want to leverage the opportunities because you don't know when you're going to check out. Understanding with a, a, a sense of urgency because you realize that, man, if, if I'm going to take advantage of opportunities, I got to be ready when the opportunity comes. I can't tell the opportunity, hold up, give me a minute, I need to go get ready. Because the opportunity is like, I'm gone. Right? So I need to be ready, which is why I need to manage my energy so I can be ready when the opportunity comes for me to maximize what God has for me in that moment. You see, redeeming the time is this reminder that we only get one life. You get one life. And once it's over on earth, it's not over because you live in eternity. But the impact you can have in the life of people who don't know God is over. So he talks about the importance of redeeming the time related to our walk. So that's walking wise. But not only walking wise has got to do with redeeming the time. Walking wise has to do with understanding the Lord's will. Right? See, I want to maximize my energy in the space that God says is important. When I understand the will of God, I understand, wait, wait, we, we talk about God sent his son, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. People are important to God. People are important to God. How do we know that? He gave his son, and his son gave his life for people, for people who didn't deserve it, people who are not worthy of it. So people are important to God even before they change. I just said something. People are important to God even before they change. Stop waiting on people to change for us to love them. God loved us while we were enemies, while we were ungodly, while we were sinners. And guess what? God wants us to love people while you put whatever you want on the back end of that. While they still got all their baggage, while they still acting a fool. Whatever you want to put on there, put it on there. But God wants us to love them while. Right? So it's understanding what the Lord's will is. God loves people. God desires that all would be saved and none would be lost. That's why he's delaying. God is not slack in his promises, Peter says. But he's delaying the time of his return. Why? He wants all to repent. You mean God wants everybody to know him and be in relationship with him? God wants everybody to experience wholeness in him. God wants everybody to experience that peace we sang about, that hope we sang about, that joy we sang about, that strength we sang about. He wants every person that he created to experience that. Yes, understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand what God wants. And then because that's important to our creator, then it should be important to the people he created. And when it becomes important to the people he created, we prioritize what's important. So, I need to manage my energy understanding the will of God because I want to prioritize what's important to God. Now, I'm human just like everybody else in the room. So, 
Sometimes I have crazy thoughts. Well, most of the time I have crazy thoughts, but um, sometimes I have crazy thoughts related to my encounter with God. Sometimes I think to myself, I'm like, man, God, I don't know if I'm ready to have some conversations with you when I see you. Right? About whatever, I mean, if you, if you knew that was so important to me, then why did you waste all your time doing all this other stuff that you knew wasn't important to me? I don't want to have that conversation. Right? I, don't, I think about, the Lord says that you, we're going to have to give an account for every idle word. It's like, God, are we going to go over them word by word? Can we just batch them together? You know what I'm saying? It's like, okay, we covered that category. We can move on now, right? But I bring that up to say, understanding what the will of God is. And because we understand what the will of God is, then we want to manage our energy to say, God, I want to prioritize what you prioritize. I don't want to spend my whole life doing stuff that God didn't say was significant. Oh, please hear what I am not saying. Because I am not saying that your day job is not significant to God. Your job is just as important as my job. God has placed you where he's placed you for his glory and his honor and God expects of you everything he expects of anybody in what we call Christian ministry on your job if you look at it the character requirements and expectations are the same attitude requirements and expectations are the same all of us are to share the gospel all of us are to make disciples right it's the same so please hear, I am not saying that. Do your job and do everything you do for the glory of God. That's all God is asking for. That whatever you do, you're saying to yourself, God, how do I manage my energy in such a way that when I show up, I show up with your priorities on my mind. And I'm making sure that my schedule is aligning with what you say is important. So we begin with this whole piece of a walk and understand it's a wise walk. Here's the last thing. It's a spiritual walk. Why? Because in the scripture it talks about, it talks about, don't be like fools. Once you be wise, redeem in time, understand what the will of the Lord is. And then don't be drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. And then he talks about all the things we do in a life of worship because we're filled with the spirit. Now, um, how many of you not Baptists? You didn't grow up Baptist. Didn't grow up Baptist. Didn't grow up Baptist. Bless you. Bless you. So for those of you who didn't grow up Baptist, I'll be right back. For many of us who grew up Baptist, we struggle with the spirit. Third person in the guy here who lives on the inside of us, who is supernatural in all of his power who operates according to the leading of the Father, who is in alignment with the Son and is always pointing back to the Son. And yet there is so much scripture that we have about the Holy Spirit filling us, right? I love the analogy. I know most of y'all ain't been drunk. No, you haven't been drunk. So you don't understand when he uses that analogy. When he talks about not being drunk with wine, I know you have no idea what he's talking about, right? No idea. Maybe you saw somebody on a movie or something, right? You understand when a person is drunk with wine, there comes a point when the oil takes over. And when the oil takes over, they get what people used to call liquid courage. <laughs> right? Be like, whoo, you ain't never said nothing like that. It's the oil. It's the oil. It's the oil. I'm going to forgive you because I know it's the oil. It's the oil talking right now, right? There's this whole idea that there is something inside of you that is all of a sudden taking control of you and is influencing you in such a way that you can't help but yield to the influence. Uh, don't be drunk with wine wearing is in excess, but be filled. It's actually be being filled, be constantly filled. See, a drunk is not always drunk. They just drink so much that every time you see them, it looks like they're drunk. 
They don't always drink, but they drink so much that every time you see them, like, yeah, they are drunk. Why? Because most of the time I see them, they drunk. Not all the time, but most of the time. Be being filled in such a way that the testimony that we have is that we are people influenced by, controlled by, got some spiritual courage because we are being guided by the Holy Spirit. I know. So I'm back to all the rest of y'all now because some of the Baptists got with me, some of them didn't. But here, here's why this is important, because when it's a spirit-filled walk, it means, first, I am not in control. I got to yield. Mm. Is that hard for anybody else? To yield so that the Holy Spirit, when there is a prompting, we just say, yes. We don't say, Really? Are you sure? Can we talk about it? Right? We don't go through all that. We just say, yes. And we trust his influence to guide us and direct us in a way that would be pleasing and honoring to the Father. It is a surrendered walk. But it's also a walk that understands that after I've done everything I can, because I have a responsibility, right, to take care of myself physically, to take care of myself mentally, to take care of myself emotionally, to do my best spiritually. I have a responsibility in that. But after I've done all of that, it's the reminder that I have some supernatural power that's on the work on the inside that, that, that compensates and overcompensates for my natural power. And as I rely on the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit, I can sometimes operate beyond the three to five of peak performance because I got spirit power carrying me through the rest. So my managing of energy is so that I can partner with the spirit. I want to be at optimal level in every way so that as the spirit leads, I can follow. That's why we talk about the importance of managing our energy. Can we just be honest? Most of us have done a poor job managing our energy. Can we just be honest? Can we just be honest? Most of us, we, some of y'all just woke up from your nap during this service. you like, he's still talking, he's still talking. <laughs> you thought you was going to wake up to the music. <laughs> <laughs> you just woke up while your energy down. <laughs> right? But here's the reality. We, God wants us to be at optimal energy level for us to manage our energy so that we can fulfill and maximize ourselves in time so that we can fulfill our purpose so that we can be on display for his glory. I know you wouldn't believe it, so I'll read it. Um, I'm a visual learner. I love learning in other ways, but I'm a visual learner. So oftentimes I need to see stuff. I do better sometimes when I see stuff. It helps things to stick with me. And I think Paul understood that. He says it right here in Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read the whole first 10 verses. Listen to what he says. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Hear this. So... God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed in. You can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. But we are God's masterpiece he has created us anew in christ jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago please hear me 
We need to maximize our energy and maximize the time that we have so that we can fulfill the purpose of God. Why? Because we are God's masterpiece. Every time somebody sees us, they're seeing the handiwork of God. And God has put us on display so when people see us, they're like, wow, where do I get one of those? How do I live like that? How do I respond like that? How do I interact like that? Who does that? When people see us, it should spark interest in the God that we serve because we are his masterpieces on display. So I just ask this morning, how are you doing? maximizing and managing your energy so you can maximize the opportunities that God gives you in time to fulfill your God-given purpose for his glory and his honor. Here's the bottom line. It will depend upon you. I can't do it for you. The person next to you can't do it for you. It will depend Upon you making a choice. God, I want to be at my best. Because I want everybody to see how good and how great and how awesome the God that I serve really is. Come on, let's thank God for his word. <laughs> yeah. So as they prepare to come, I want you to take a few moments and, and bow. This is your time with God, you and God. Take a few moments, you and God. God, you are not one who deals in guilt, shame, or condemnation. So if there's any of that, we know that's not of you. You don't give us your word to condemn us. You give us your truth to set us free. So help us to figure out what nuggets of truth you want us to grab hold of. What nuggets of truth you want us not just to know, but to apply. What one thing this week you want us to prioritize so that we can be at our best for your glory and your honor. God, we want to be able to close our eyes just as Jesus said, I finished the work. We want to be able to close our eyes and be just like Paul and say, I finished the work. God, we don't want to die before we're done. So help us make the choice. Manage our energy we can be all that you created us to be, we can be all that you created us to be, so that whenever we close our eyes, we we'll close our eyes knowing it's finished. Bless now my brothers and my sisters, pray God you would speak to them and encourage them and challenge them. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that this is not a work that we can do on our own. We got help, supernatural power living on the inside of us. Somebody in the room or online may not know you as God and Father, may not know Jesus as Savior and Lord. We're thankful that you love them, that you have a plan and a purpose for them. They even took the time to be here or to tune in pray that you would continue to draw them to you, draw them to Jesus the Christ. Holy Spirit, convict of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, that they might surrender. Say, what must I do to be saved is our prayer. In Jesus' name.